Hello, welcome to Lessons with Jeff Thompson. Today we're talking about the three second fighter. Um, before we start, I just want to distinguish between different kinds of fighting because most people don't seem to appreciate that there are different forms. Basically we've got match fighting, which is square go on the common, or if you look at the ultimate fight competition, which is brilliant fighting, it's that's match fighting. Um, and you've got ambush fighting, which is when somebody just dives out of a bush or out of an entry and just attacks you, or some, suddenly someone just grabs you and you react. In, in match fighting and ambush fighting, it tends to, we tend to be working on reaction and not response. Reaction being the subconscious movement or, uh, you know, working on a subconscious level. Um, then we've got the three second fighter. The enemy of today is a three second fighter. He's not a match fighter because he hasn't got the courage to match fight. He's not so much an ambush fighter, although ambush fighting still happens. Especially because people, are, uh, people walking around are so unaware of their environment and unaware of the enemy. Um, so most of them are three second fighters. That is, they come through dialogue. There's a bit of dialogue, a bit of argument, and then a fight. The fight generally lasts about three seconds if you're dealing with someone that knows what he's doing, it won't even last that long. It will use dialogue, deception, distraction to get destruction. Okay? He's not, he's, not a, he's not a brave enemy. He will ask you a question. He may ask you directions. He may ask you time. Uh, he may just ask you what you're looking at. Okay? He'll ask you something to distract you. He will go through a ritual of movements, a ritual of body language, um, and uh, a ritual of street speak, generally, before he attacks. This is where we come in, where we use a fence, which is a lead hand, to control the range um, and finish the fight ourselves within three seconds. Again, working on the premise that we've, we haven't been able to escape and we haven't been able to use verbal dissuasion to get rid of the situation. <clears throat> now, in, in the video today, we're going to be talking primarily about the three-second fighter, about putting up a fence, about using verbal and psychological fences. Um, and we're going to be talking about the three seconds before a fight kicks off. Because everybody tends to deal with um, ambush fighting or sparring, match fighting, but they don't deal with reality. And reality is the three seconds before a fight. It's the three to five seconds before a fight that determines who's going to win. If you're dealing with somebody that knows what he's doing, a street fighter, he will use that three seconds to manipulate you and take you off the planet. And you can go home and talk about how unfair and how unjust it was, but you're still in hospital and he's still in profit. Okay, so the enemy of today is not the enemy of yesterday. The enemy has changed. In my father's generation, it was match fighting. There was a lot of honour. Um, and people would meet on the common, they would have a fight, they would sort out the problems and that would be the end of it. The enemy, the enemy of today is not like that. So we, we, lots of people are training for the wrong range. So we've got to train more for the three second fight, the deceptive fighter. Match fighting still has to be addressed because if a, second, if a fight goes beyond three seconds, we end up in a match fight anyway. And nine times out of ten, it will end up on the floor. So partly today we're going to be talking about how to train for match fighting, which is basically animal day. That's a good way of training for match fighting because it encompasses every range. We're also going to be talking about how to train for ambush fighting, which is reaction fighting. Okay, which is what, which is subconscious stuff. Um, <clears throat> but the main part of the, the video is going to be about the three second fighting. Um, and this is response, not reaction. If somebody walks up and asks me what I'm looking at, then I'm going to respond and not react. Okay, so I'm just going to put my, my fence up. I'm going to try and control the situation. I'm going to try and talk my way out of it. I'm going to try and get away. But if I can't, then I'm going to use this fence to block the range, um, the first chance I get, I'm going to take him off the planet with my main artillery punch or finger strike or whatever it is. So that's what we're going to cover in the video today. Um, the circle training and line training is excellent for, uh, for ambush and, and uh, reaction fighting. Okay, so we're going to be looking at that as much as we can. Um, but the main thing is I want to try and get across is the fact that today's fighter is a three second fighter. Now, I'm not saying that in 10 years' time I won't have to review this and look at it again, because if the enemy changes tomorrow, my tactics will change. What we've got at the moment in a lot of the martial arts, with no disrespect intended, 
is we've got arts that are fighting, and in they're, they're kind of antiquated arts. They're, they're people that are fighting um, samurais on horseback. Okay, the art part of it, it doesn't have to change. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that the training's got to change. But we're not fighting in the real world. We're not fighting from three or four feet away. We're fighting from 18 inches. The enemy of the day wants to be in your face. So. Considering that we're training to fight today's enemy, most people don't understand today's enemy. So one of the things we're going to look at today is the ritual of attack. The, the body language in the street speak of an, uh, of, a, of an attacker, the movements and the words he will use before he attacks. If you look at a, uh, a, game, uh, a game hunter, if he goes out to hunt the tiger, he knows everything about the tiger, everything from where he eats to where he sleeps to, to where he shits to where he makes love, um, he knows every movement of the animal. He knows exactly the movements that tiger will make before he pounces, before attack. And that's when he will attack. And if he makes a mistake on that, then he could be dead. Well, the enemy of today is the same. He has got, a, he has got an innate ritual that we've got to learn, which I want to try and educate you on today. Um, and we've got to learn exactly what he's going to say and what he's going to do before he attacks, so that we can by understanding the enemy, we can preempt him and attack him first. To do this, we need a game plan. It's very easy for people to say that um, your reaction in a real fight should be according to, to, to your opponent's action. But what that's saying is, um, you know, we're working on spontaneity, we're working on um, allowing the attacker to attack first, but that is not a sound concept, because the concept of defence, of blocking, is not good. If you've got someone 18 inches away from you, you're not likely to be able to block what they do. If you put in three or four foot away from me, then I'll have a chance. But three or four foot, I can turn and run away. Most situations are going to be at punching range. This is conversation range. And the, the, the chance of blocking somebody is minimal. So what we've got to learn to do is put the fence up, guard the range that we're given, so it doesn't degenerate into grappling range, and then put a game, uh, put our main artillery in, which is one or two punches that we want to train on. Not having a mental log jam of uh, 50 techniques, but one or two techniques. The power base to make this work is awareness. If we've got awareness, we, uh, this is awareness of environment, but also awareness of attack ritual. We can see attacks coming in, like the hunter, we can watch the enemy come in, we can line him up, we can size him up, and if we can't get away from him, we can take him out but you need awareness to do that. So part of what we're going to do today is like educating, edu educating people in the awareness of attack ritual, um, telling them, trying to put across the, the point that you do need a game plan, you do, you do need to have one or two main artillery techniques, and that you also have to have a big support system. So if the main artillery technique doesn't work, I'm not in the shit. If my, my line-up punch, my sniper option doesn't work, then I can fall into my support system, which nine times out of ten is going to be grappling. Because if you lose, if the fight goes more than three seconds, nine times out of ten it'll end up on the floor. If you know what you're doing on the floor, that's not a problem because you'll destroy somebody. Again, going back to the other videos, if you look at the ground fighting videos, then you can train, train to fight on the floor, but it's very much part of the support system. So we're going to be looking at main artillery um, to give you one or two good punches or good techniques that you can take someone out with straight away. Right, we've already spoken about understanding yourself. Now we're going to talk about understanding the enemy. Because as we said with the Sun Tzu quote, it's 50-50. If you understand yourself but you don't understand the enemy, then you'll lose 50 and win 50. Okay, so we don't want to lose any. Understanding the enemy is understanding the ritual that he goes through before he attacks. There's a lot of detail with it. Most of it is within the Animal Day book. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd ask you to refer to that to get the exact detail. But this is basically uh, the body language of an attacker before he attacks, especially the gratuitous attacker. We've got uh, the arm slaying, this kind of thing. These are all precursors to attack. Okay? We've got the stancing up. Distance closed down, we're trying to get closer to you. Uh, we've got the neck pecking, head coming forward. All this is going to be demonstrated in a minute. We've got the head nodding, this, this kind of thing, especially to underline verbal. Um, we've got the single syllables, which is the final precursor to attack. That's when somebody drops into single syllables. Yeah, and, so, 
fucking so. Okay. What this says is the attack is imminent. It's going to happen at any time. Understanding this enables you to be preemptive again in your escape or your attack. If you look at the game hunter, he'll, he knows the exact movement of the tiger before he before he pounces, and that's when he shoots. Not before, not after. This is exactly, this is exactly what we've got to learn ourselves. Exactly when to go. If you've got a deceptive fighter, an experienced fighter, he'll tell you that he doesn't want to fight before he hits you. But as he tells you he doesn't want to fight, he'll be closing the gap. If he's closing the gap, it's because he wants to put one on you. If he says he doesn't want to fight and he's moving backwards, he's not a threat. If he says he, do, if he, says he doesn't want to fight and he's moving forwards, then he is a threat. There's a couple of lads who work in Coventry who always say, I don't want to fight before they hit you. Okay, you might think that's fair, you might think it's unfair, it doesn't really matter, that's what's going to happen. So understanding, understanding that an experienced attacker is going to be deceptive, he'll tell you he doesn't want trouble, he want to talk about it, he wants to put his arm around you, he wants to touch you, and as soon as he comes into contact, as soon as he brings down your fence, then you're out of the game. Um, if you've got multiple attackers, they will probably use the pincer movement, that is, one will engage you in the front, you've got tunnel vision, so you'll probably only see him, and the second or the third will come down to your, your peripheral sides here. It's not usually the one at the front that attacks you, he just engages you, it's the one at the side. That's where the real danger is again. We're going to talk a little bit later about the fence, about putting up a fence to occupy and control this ground. But for now, we're just going to go through some of the uh, um, aggressive attack rituals, which we'll use the lads for. As you've just seen, the lads are working on um, being aggressive, taking aggression. <coughs> We're going to talk about aggression therapy a little bit later on in the video. But it's very important that you look out for the precursors to attack. The single syllables, um, tunnel, the, the uh, eye bulging, distance closed down. Someone wants to get closer to you, it's because they want to finish you. Keep up your fence, keep them away from you. If you don't understand when they're going to attack, then the, it's all, in all likelihood you're going to be attacked. Like I said about the, the hunter with the tiger, he knows exactly when the tiger is going to pounce. We need to know when our attack is going to attack. Have you ever heard the story about the circus knife thrower that tried to kill his wife, but kept missing with the knife? Or did you hear the story about the international karate event in France, when tempers were frayed and everything kicked off and people were fighting for real, and yet not one single person was hurt? That's muscle memory. Muscle memory goes with whatever you train. If you train for contact, muscle memory will bring on contact when spontaneity takes the reins. If you train for semi-contact, that's what you'll get. So the knife thrower that's trained to miss his wife missed her when he really wanted to hit her. And the karate people in the tournament that uh, trained for points at an international level, when they came to a real fight, they pulled their blows. It's not that they're not powerful people, it's that they're trained to pull their blows. If you train for semi-contact, that's what you'll get in a real situation. If you train to miss with techniques, um, that's what you'll get also. <clears throat> so muscle memory needs to be positive. So you need to train for contact, um, and you need also to train not to give in. If you give in in the gym when you've got a bloody nose, or when you feel sick, or when you feel, feel tired or nauseous, then that's what you'll do in a real situation. It's like a blank disc in a computer. You will only get off it what you put on it. 
So you have to train for contact, otherwise muscle memory will, will start throwing out semi-contact blows. Compliancy as well is also a bit of a dodgy old affair. With compliancy, it's excellent to learn technique. You need compliancy to learn and perfect the technique. But once you've perfected the technique, you don't need compliancy anymore for that technique. You need an uncompliant opponent and you need to put it on against his will. Compliancy trains you to lose. If you're, uh, if you're training, for instance, an armbar or a choke, your opponent's letting you put it on. <clears throat> so he's letting you beat him. So too much compliancy is actually training, training yourself to lose. So once you've got the technique, you've got to put it under pressure, like in the Animal Day video, put it under pressure and develop the muscles that you need to hold or work that technique in a real situation. Compliancy does not develop the right muscles to keep a technique on. If I'm doing a 5-4 quarter hold down, um, like the ones in the, in the grappling videos, um, and I've got compliancy, then I'm not developing the muscles I need to keep that pin still. If I, so what I've got to do is learn the technique, and then I've got to put it into an uncompliant arena. And that's when I'll develop the reality. And it will also show me whether the technique's any good or not. What we're going to show you now is some of the lads working on pads, uh, kicking, punching, and they're working for contact. We don't touch semi-contact, because if, you, if you're doing semi-contact work, that's what you're going to do in a real situation. Even at an international level, uh, uh, Ian McCrane was supporting international for six years. And he said himself that when he started working the doors, um, the semi-contact training was forcing him to pull punches on the door, so he had to start training for contact. But of course when you start training for contact, then you start getting disqualified in tournaments because muscle memory forces you to throw a full contact blow. But if you're training for sport, then, then there is obviously a bit of a paradox. But what, we need, what we're talking about now is training for reality. When you're training for reality, you train for contact. In the modern dojo, naked aggression is frowned upon, seen as bad etiquette. In the street, fights are won and lost with naked aggression. And it's mostly because people are not used to it. I've seen many people win fights and lose fights purely because of naked aggression. And the person that is aggressive has quite often got nothing. He's got nothing behind it. But what aggression does is when someone suddenly just switches on, um, it causes adrenal, uh, adrenal dump in the recipient. So if someone suddenly just stands in front of you and they're an animal, they're a maniac and they're really switching on, you get adrenal dump. And it doesn't matter how many techniques you're carrying or how good your right cross is or, you know, what a good kick you are or whatever, it doesn't make no difference because you've lost the fight from the inside out. The way we overcome this is we do aggression therapy, okay? We're careful not to do it while there's children about because of the swearing, but it needs to have swearing because whether you like it or not, swearing is reality. 
okay so aggression therapy is many fold what it does is it gets you used to taking aggression so it's not so shocking um, it gets you used to giving aggression so you can learn to switch on with aggression aggression is a very powerful tool remember a guy um, in london one of the doormen in london all he used to beat his opponents was his voice he would switch on and be so aggressive that he would give everyone adrenal dump and he would win, his, win most of his fights with it. I've seen a bloke stand in front of three other guys and stand in a karate style stance in Kiai. That's all he did and the three guys ran off. The guy couldn't fight sleep but he had a good Kiai. So aggression therapy enables you to learn to take aggression and to give aggression. Also it's very therapeutic to stand and shout anyway because it gets all, the, all this psychological shit out of your system. People think nothing about um, going to the toilet every day to get rid of their physical waste. But what about the psychological waste? We're kind of in a, a paradoxical society where we've got lots of intangible conf confrontations, you know, of running with the boss or confrontation at home where we can't run and we can't fight. So there's unutilized adrenaline. That needs, that needs to be spent. This is, the place to spe this is the place to spend that aggression. Um, get out of your system. We don't want to be going home and falling out with our wife and kids because we've got aggression brought on by some vindictive boss or someone that's cut, up, cut us up in the car. So this is the place to get it out. But like I said, it can be used as a tool. You can beat people with your voice alone, which we'll talk about later on. The voice can be used as, as a psychological fence. Hey, blah, blah. What's up with you? Is that what you fucking blah, blah. Calm down. You are a fucking problem. Hey, you fucking bastard. Calm down. Come on, you fucker. Calm down. You a fucking bit, wanker. Hey. Come on. Chill out. Come on, you fat fucking woke. Come on, you bastard. Well, why wasn't you? Because you, you fucking hey. wanker. Come on. Come on. Rest. Hey, what are you looking at? Fucking Come you. on. Me and you now. Come on. What are you looking at? Fucking you, man. Come on. What's up with you? Come on! Let's go! Me and you, now! Come on! What are you looking at? Do you want to go for it, do you? Come on! Me and you! Let's go for it! You weren't saying that last time! Come on, let's do it! Come on! Me and you, one on one! Come on! Nah, not at all! That weren't it the other day! Come on, let's fucking do it! Come on! Come on! Come on, get on! Get your hands down! Do it! Come on! Me and you, one on one! Yeah. Come on then, eh? What were you looking at then? Put your hands down, eh? You're fucking looking at me! You got a problem with me, have ya? Hey? You got a problem with me, you had a problem just a minute ago, didn't ya? Just get your hands down. Look, you stay Get your hands down, eh? Stay where you are. What you got your hands up for then if you ain't got a problem? Hey? What you got your hands up for? You stay there then, we can talk. I'm staying there, hey? Come on. What's your problem? Come on! You're the one. Come on, let's have it! Come on, you the beauty of aggression therapy is that um, although on a conscious level we know it's controlled, the subconscious mind works separate from the conscious mind. So the subconscious mind will still register trauma and it will give you adrenaline even in the controlled environment. So as well as getting used to um, people being aggressive and getting desensitized to it, you're also getting exposure to adrenaline because you, you know you can't control the subconscious mind in that respect so that's one of the good things about it also it gives you a good chance to practice putting up the fence keeping that distance controlled what we're going to look at now is the support system we've already mentioned in the intro the main artillery that is having one or two highly trained techniques that you will use as your main artillery in your game plan the support system is to back up this game plan or the sniper option, this one big shot, the, the, the one punch kill. The support, the support system is there to back that up in case it goes wrong. Or in the case of other things like uh, what Dave Turton would call uh, what if situations. What if you're ambushed? Uh, what if it's a match fight? What if you've got a right hook and, and, and um, the guy's wearing a, a crash helmet? You know, what if any, what if all the, all the different alternatives? So basically, your main artillery would be just one or two techniques that you will use um, in the majority of situations. The support system is everything else you've trained in. The support system still has to be pressure tested. That's what we're going to do in a minute. We're going to do some uh, circle training and some line training. With the, the sniper option, this is putting up your fence and using that one big punch um, 
you know, with your power base being awareness so that you can see situations coming in, we, we're talking about response. Yeah. If somebody walks up to me, I've, I've noticed the situation develop because I'm aware. Somebody walks up to me and I've got a, a bit of a situation, I'll respond on a conscious level by putting up a fence, trying to talk my way out of it, um, and if I can't, if I can't escape or if I can't talk my way out of it, putting in that sniper option, that one-punch kill. The, a the ambush or the match fight or the, the what-if situations are reaction, which is a subconscious reaction to something that goes on, a subconscious movement. Um, if someone walks up to me, I'll respond by putting my guard up, putting my fence up. If someone just attacks me, I'll react. Circle training develops positive reaction. Um, again, as I said earlier on, if, you're, if, you're, if you've developed a reaction to pull your punches or to stop when your nose bleeds or to stop when you feel tired, that's what you'll do in a real situation. So what I want to do is reverse that and develop positive reactions. That means if somebody um, ambushes you or you have a match fight, then your reactions to whatever happens um, will be in your game plan. You know, it'll, be, it'll actually be fixed in. So what we're going to do now is a, a bit of circle training and a little bit of line training. This is restricted circle training, so anyone from the circle can attack at any time. All they'll do is say the lad's name who's in the centre and attack, but they're restricted to a rugger tackle. We'll also restrict it to punches and eventually we'll go all out, so the person in the centre will have to react to whatever comes. It's not sparring, it's just ambush. So if someone just dives out of a crowd and jumps on you, this will train positive reaction. Okay. So the same as before, just say build and then run out straight into the rugby tackle from the back, from, the, from wherever you can get it. No warning for him, only on his name. Bill! to a prone position. We're only fighting to a prone position, okay? Because it's limited. Okay, Justin's still out. Justin!
Now we're doing circle training, but we're restricting it to punching. So the attacker in the, uh, on the outside of the circle is going to come in with a punch. As with the rug attacker, it's going to be full contact, and his intention is to put the bloke down. If you can knock him out, then you should knock him out. This is heavy-duty pressure testing. This will develop positive reaction. Um, it won't be pretty to watch, but it'll be real, and this is what's going to happen in a real situation. If someone rushes you or ambushes you, you're not going to be blocking them and countering them. You're just going to be reacting. So this will develop positive reaction. Nine times out of ten of your ambush, it's going to end up on the floor anyway. But that's okay if you're trained to fight on the floor. So this is limited now to just punching. And we'll try and stop the fight when somebody reaches a prone position. Then I'm actually going out to finish. That'll be coming a little bit later on. Good on Dee. Okay, that's good. Okay. Stop. Stop. Oh. Andy! Oh, whoever wants to do it again. What do you say that? Say it again. Andy! Okay, as soon as he's up, as soon as he's up, press him on. of circle training is all out it's not like it's a bit like animal day but it's not it's it's not match fighting because he's going to be ambushed so the ambusher has got the initiative but what they're going to do now is no no restriction on technique no restriction on control they're just going to go out and they're going to try and stop them um, and we're going to let the fight go to a conclusion when they go to the ground we'll pull the gloves off the only restriction once they're down there is the same as animal day using open hand instead of bare knuckle um, bite, but bite to release, gouge, but just to touch. This is so that you learn to defend against bites and you learn to defend against <coughs> gouges. This is, again, you know, to reiterate, we're training to uh, get good reaction for an ambush. Come in! Oh, 
reality reality is scruffy um, and I know a lot of you be out there looking and thinking yeah but if he did this kick if he did that punch most of these lads are, are good amateur boxers um, and they're downgraded in karate um, and the, the, the aesthetic look disappears when you put pressure on um, like I said in, in the Animal Day video, you also get tired quicker because of the pressure's on, because you've got the turbo drive of adrenaline. <clears throat> People often look at this kind of thing and say, well, when he ran in, I would do this and I would do that move and I'd do another move. What you've got to do is try it. Don't take my word for it, you've got to feel it. Most of the stuff, um, most of the nice looking stuff disappears like a penny down the drain. Um, if you look at someone like Linford Christie, he will cover... 100 meters in 10 seconds that's 30 feet a second um, now if you compute that with a real situation when you've got somebody three feet away from you that are adrenal loaded and they want to be in your face you can see why that distance is lost the distance you've got there in theory you think when he rushes in i'll uppercut him i'll knee him i'll catch him with a stop side kick in reality it doesn't work because that distance is lost in the blink of an eye if you can cover 30 feet in a second how fast can you cover three feet? or two feet. This is the purpose of what we're going to do now, the line training. And again, don't, don't look for aesthetic technique because it isn't going to be there. But once you understand what you're looking at, once you understand what this baby is all about, it has an aesthetic look all of itself. Um, if you look at the judo people, the wrestlers, it doesn't look pretty. But when you know what you're looking at, it looks beautiful. It's excellent but you've got to get an appreciation for what's here. The best thing, the best way to do that is to try these exercises, to put them into your own club. And you will see the bloke with a brilliant sidekick, the brilliant roundhouse, the 
technical uh, uh, Gyakazuki and Gazami, you will see you will see all that disappear, and you'll see scruffy, scruffiness come into its own. This is something I've always said, but don't take my word for it. You must try it. Feeling is believing, as my friend Mr. Constantine keeps telling me. What we're going to do now is move on to line training. Line training is again uh, partly ambush, but this is when um, you've got actually got somebody in front of you. Um, but you've got no fence up, you've got no guard there to stop him blocking that range. I want to show you how quickly that distance is lost. The person at the front, at the head of the line is allowed to use a punching technique, but he can try and knock the person out with it. He can go full contact. Um, again, this is restricting it to punching. You can restrict it to just kicking. You can restrict it to just kneeing. Or uh, at the end of it, you can, re you can have no restrictions. Um, what we'll do, we'll start off with someone at two feet and then move it a little bit further back to five feet. I want to show you how quickly that distance is lost. The blink of an eye and that's why nine out of ten fights end up on the ground because that's reality. Um, and again I don't want people saying yeah but if I really put this technique in, do it, try it. Obviously, obviously you've got to have supervision, you've got to have people supervising so that there's no bad injuries but you've got to try it, feel it for yourself. Um, <coughs> We'll move on to the line training and we'll have a talk about it again afterwards. Okay, have a look at how it goes. I want you to be close enough to touch it, which is about, about, about here. So your arms reach, that's about, yeah. So put your, put your fence up a minute. That's where you'd keep him, that's okay. So from there, but he's got a guard up now. Yeah, so all I want you to do is dive in. Okay, so he has a guard up. He's got a guard up this time, yeah. Okay, you have a guard up yeah. there. So, so I'm just like, we're more Just put your guard, guard up, up. Guard. So I'm, I'm to the... so much room back but I want you to knock him out on the way in. Yeah. I want you to catch him on the way in. Okay. Okay? Are you ready? Go. Thank you. 
What you've got to do is try the exercises. Don't look at it um, and, and be like a, like a sofa fighter and say what you would do and what you wouldn't do. Try it in your own dojo, try it in your own gym um, and put yourself under pressure. And then you'll, work, you'll get workable techniques from there. What we're going to move on to now is the fence, which, we've, which you've already seen demonstrated, but basically the fence is putting your hands in front of you and guarding the range you've got. You're going to be given conversation range which is punching range now we haven't really got much choice on that especially in the three second fight so what we're going to do is maintain that fence okay so we've got the pleading fence which is here which is controlling it's a submissive fence but it's still blocking and guarding that range we've got the staggered fence which is here again very easy to punch off these fences or finger strike whichever you want to do basically you're guarding that you're guarding this area it, it, it needs to be um, very unassuming. It doesn't want to be like a karate kind of, or, or a kind of kung fu fence. It wants to be a very natural, how you would stand in a pub kind of fence. Uh, you've got the excl exclamation fence, which is guarding, and your big hand back here for your, for your uh, sniper option, your main artillery punch. Um, you can also use your left hand and come forward and have a fence this way, so you, you're blocking with this. As though, as though you're talking to someone in the pub and you're saying, I can't hear what you're saying. You're blocking range and you're lining up, you're, you're kind of priming your punch for attack. Um, we've also got uh, a verbal fence, which is somebody standing uh, maybe outside of arm range and you're just being very aggressive and you're saying, stay where you are, just stay where you are. That's a verbal fence. Okay, that stops people coming forward. You can also back that up. You can back the verbal fence up with, with your uh, physical fence. So you say, stay where you are, just stay there, stay where you are. Okay, um, we've also got um, a psychological fence. I had a, a, there was a guy in Coventry who bit someone's nose off 30 years ago. That put a fence around him for 30 years. Nobody would fight him because of that fence. Okay, they wouldn't go within five feet of him because they thought if they fought him and they lost, he would bite something off, and he would. Now that's a psychological fence. Um, another psychological fence is uh, just, just your gait, the way you stand. If you've got a face like 10 boxes or you've got a very confident persona, that acts as a fence as well. It takes you out of a victim state because there's a fence around you. A fence around you that says, don't mess with this bloke. We've also got, um, uh, you've, got you, you've got a negative psychological fence. That is, if I've, got a, if I've got a fence up and I'm maintaining this distance, but I want to draw the bloke into me so I can attack him, if I've got no, no means of escape, then I can drop the physical fence as he moves forward, you boom, then you can move in with your preemptive attack. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to go through a few of these fences, working with the lads. We're also going to talk about um, in-fight and pre-fight um, psychological fences. That is, if I'm fighting on the floor with somebody um, and his mate wants to run in and kick me, I can use an in-fight fence, which is a psychological fence. Within the fight, I can say to his mate, you stay where you are, otherwise you're going to get involved. I'll come around your house when you're having tea with your mum. So you kick me in the face while I'm fighting with him, and you've got a problem afterwards. That puts a fence up for him. It's a psychological fence. <clears throat>
Stay where you are. Stay where you are! Now, stay there! Stay there, or it's me and you! Right! Stay back! trying to say? Yes! Don't know, know what you're trying to say. Yes! What are you trying to say then? Yes! Yes! What are you trying to say? Yes! What are you trying to say then? Yes! What are you trying to say? Yes! What are you trying to say? Yes! Okay, just as a conclusion, remember what I said. You've got to distinguish between match fighting Three second fighting and ambush fighting, they're all different. You have to train for them differently. Your bread and butter, your biggest bedrock, is your fence and your main artillery. Having one or two techniques that you know will work for you. Not everyone can perfect the whole system, but anyone can perfect one or two techniques. Most of the really good fighters that I've worked with have gone through hundreds of fights on one technique. They use it as a game plan but they have to have awareness as their power base. They see situations develop because they're switched on, and when they do develop and when they come into their area, they control it with a fence, and they put in one stopping technique. If that doesn't work, they've got a massive support system. So if they go to grappling or, or if it goes to any other range, they're there. So it's very important. If you've got a main artillery and you've got a support system, pressure test it all. Don't have anything that hasn't been pressure tested because you don't know if it's gonna work. Put it into pressure in the circle training, line training, um, animal day especially, <clears throat> um, and then you'll know whether it works or not. And you'll also know your own weaknesses and strengths. Just to conclude, um, I'd like to apologise for the swearing in the video, but if you want realism, that's part and parcel of it. I know there's a lot of people out there who'll say, oh, this is gratuitous and this is out of order, but swearing is a big part of realism. It's used against you, and it can be used for you. You start swearing and using um, expletives to underline your, you know, your verbal, it will have a better effect on people. 
and that is how, that's how it is in the real world. Start looking for the scruffy elements. That's the stuff that really works. Look at your boxing, your wrestling, your judo, um, and you know, the, the real kind of, um, the stuff that looks scruffy, the stuff that doesn't look aesthetic. The aesthetic stuff usually crumbles under pressure. Um, and you know, again, I wish you all the best with it. I hope the video helps. Um, if you want to work on the techniques from the different ranges, then look at the ground fighting series, look at Animal Day, but above all, put pressure into what you're doing and you'll find out whether or not it's real.